Welcome to this FLAME webinar. I'm Heidi Stancliffe, Co-Editor-in-Chief for the FLAME Conference. We will also be live tweeting this webinar, so you can join in the conversation using the hashtag FLAMEWebinar. The dramatic fluctuation in the price of fossil fuels has been a topic of contention and confusion. Dieter Helm, Fellow at New College Oxford, is going to explain why the commodity supercycle is coming to an end and why people fail to predict this. With an eye to the past incorrect predictions, Dieter will give his view of the market and how it will move forwards. Following this Flame exclusive presentation, I will be joined by a panel of industry experts to discuss Dieter's comments. I'm sitting with Phil Murphy, Vice President and Global Head of Government and Public Affairs for BG Group. Phil will open the discussion to a panel of experts. Patrick Baruki, Head of Gas Trading and Origination at Uniper Global Commodities. Howard Rogers, Director of Natural Gas Re the Research Programme at the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies, and Cameron Hepburn, Professor of Environmental Economics at the University of Oxford. Welcome, everyone. Before I hand over to Dieter, I'd like to remind you that we'll be holding an interactive Q&A after the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can send them to us using the orange Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And now, over to Dieter. The recent developments in oil, gas and indeed coal markets have taken lots of people by surprise. But um, they shouldn't have been taken by surprise really because this was predictable. And what I would like to do uh, in this video is first of all explain why the uh, commodity super cycle has come to an end and hence prices have come crashing down. Secondly, uh, why people failed to predict what was going to happen. And then I'll move on to look to the medium and longer term and argue that there's a good reason for believing that uh, uh, the new oil prices are indeed the new normal and that uh, there probably won't in the medium and especially in the long term be any return to the kind of prices we got familiar with in the last five, six, seven years. So let's start with the uh, commodity super cycle. It was... Uh, an economic cycle. It was driven by an enormous increase in demand, overwhelmingly from China. That demand fed through into the price. Uh, because prices had been low in the late 1990s, there was a lag in terms of investment. And as the prices went up, the market did what the market should do. So uh, as prices rose, uh, people brought in new marginal supplies, deep water supplies, Canadian tar sands, even contemplated up to the Arctic. And uh, uh, across the world, people began to explore new production technologies. And so in the space of just seven years, US shale production alone transformed both world oil and gas markets. The US went from the potential major market for LNG gas going forward from countries like Qatar and indeed Australia to being a net uh, gas exporter. Uh, so it's self-sufficient in gas now. And on the oil side, it managed to add 3 million barrels in the space of just that seven year window and therefore, therefore transform world oil markets. So we've had the spike. It's done its job. Now we have China slowing down rapidly. Its transition's over. It's certainly not growing at the published numbers the Chinese uh, government trots out. And uh, we have lots of supply coming into the market. Now, very few people predicted this. The IEA repeatedly uh, predicted ever rising prices. And indeed, most European policymakers and governments thought that the ever rising oil and indeed gas prices would underpin the investment in renewables. And by about 220, all these renewables would be back in the market, competitive, and Europe would have a big advantage at this stage. Uh, it didn't turn out like that. And uh, the IA got it wrong but then they got it wrong in 79, and they got it wrong through most of the period in between. So did the EIA in the United States. And uh, if we look into the futures markets, you see even in 2015, repeated failures to see where the price was heading. Uh, now, 
An odd thing happened, which explains further why this price continued to fall in 2015 and why the Ford markets and the IEA and others got it so badly wrong. And that was, as the price came down, supply, particularly from the Middle East, went up. Reason? Well, uh, burgeoning populations, desperate need for the money on the one hand, and on the other, if the oil costs less than $10 to produce, it's still profitable to produce it at $30 or $40 or somewhere thereabouts. So we've had the fastest rising oil production coming from Iraq in 2015, and we have the prospect of Iraqi and Iranian oil coming into the market. So if you add that extra supply from the Middle East, you've got all the stuff coming from shale production in the United States, and you've got China slowing down, then uh, the writing is on the wall for the price, and uh, notwithstanding all these predictions to the contrary. Now, there are a lot of people running around in oil and gas companies saying effectively, well, you know, it has fallen. It's fallen more than we expected. Yes, we have been caught on the hop, but uh, you know what? It's going to go back up to 50, 60 later this year. And that at 50, 60 dollars, uh, if not the good times returning, at least better times will return. And it's just a question of sitting it out. Indeed, for the oil companies, uh, sticking to their dividend, not cutting their dividend, is a reflection of the belief that prices are going back up again. Now, I happen to think that uh, that's at least questionable. In the medium term, I mean, maybe lots of volatility in the short run, but in the medium term, we've got an enormous amount of oil still available to come into the market. We have at the moment only three countries producing 10 million barrels a day. That's Saudi, US and Russia. But both Iran and Iraq theoretically are capable of joining that 10 million barrel a day club. Imagine five countries producing 10 million barrels a day out of a total market which may be still less than 100 million barrels. That's a, a big supply boost in a context in which uh, there's no evidence that there's recovery taking place anytime soon uh, back to high growth rates in China and the US and Europe remains on a very low growth path. Only India adds to the demand package in any significant way. So in the medium term, lots more oil to come. But then what about the long term? What about all those peak oil people who think, well, we may buy some time, but you know, we're going to run out of oil and gas and hey presto, the price is going to rock it up. Well, Quite possibly, the opposite is going to be the case. There is a good argument for saying that prices will not only be lower for longer, but might be lower forever. Why? Well, because there's a huge wall of technical progress coming, enormous progress, not on current generation renewables, but future renewables. There is all the IT from smart technologies coming, there's storage, there's batteries, there's electric cars, and these are there to power robots, 3D printing, to use graphene. The list goes on and on of the wall of technical change that's coming. So it may be that demand stops going up. In fact, in the medium to longer term, demand might start coming down. And uh, if that happens, then the two markets for oil, petrochemicals, where gas is a good substitute anyway, and transport, where electric vehicles, and hybrids in the meantime, feed in. In these two markets, we can expect oil to lose ground in the uh, middle decades of this century. And as people realize that oil tomorrow might be worth less than oil today, uh, it becomes self-fulfilling because people pump to get the money now and therefore hold the price down. So what does this all add up to? Well, it's all change. The oil market is dramatically changed. Gas has changed with oil, but it has its own niches and its own markets and its own role, particularly in petrochemicals, and it may well gain at oil's expenses. And then for the companies, well, we may find that the great 20th century story of the independent oil companies and their gas provision with it may turn out to be uh, not quite so uh, rosy in the middle of this century. And indeed, the great days may be over. And in their place, a whole new range of energy companies uh, may appear, driving forward the new technologies. So it's all change. Uh, it's exciting, it's fast, it may actually address some of our carbon problems, 
It's not necessarily good news for the existing companies unless they adapt fast. Uh, and of course, the real losers are the oil producing countries cursed with resources which have done little to help their populations and done very little to promote uh, democracy and uh, freedom. So it's all change and I think that historian looking back in 10, 15, 20 years will talk about the end of 2014 being as a structural and fundamental shift in the nature of oil markets and therefore gas and coal. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the presentation, Dieter. Very interesting stuff. Before I hand over to Phil Murphy and our panel for today, I encourage you to submit your questions via the Ask a Question box at the bottom of the screen. So over to you, Phil. Okay, thanks, Heidi, and um, thanks, Dieter. Um, Thought-provoking, not to mention provocative, uh, as ever. Um, I'm going to kick off with um, a question to Howard. Um, I mean, what's your basic take on the, this description of the commodity super cycle that Dieter's just outlined and maybe looking back at how gas market evolution in the past can perhaps give us some pointers? Yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's essentially right, but I think there are different stories for different commodities. Uh, clearly, uh, in the 2005 to 2011 time frame, uh, the demand for gas uh, in China and the Asian countries trading with China uh, was uh, rising very quickly. And I think what really spurred some of the capacity we see being developed now in the LNG industry was the, um, the, the, the rapid recovery in 2010 from the you know, post-crisis recession year uh, in all the Asian LNG importing markets, which meant that you know, the LNG that had been developed for the, the U.S., uh, which wasn't needed because of shale gas, got absorbed very quickly. And, and then we had the Fukushima disaster tragedy, uh, which further tightened the LNG markets. And I think it was, um, you know, that tightening of the market that provided the spur to um, the current slew of projects in Australia and the U.S., where uh, in aggregate we, we are seeing something like 170 BCMA of LNG uh, coming onto the on, on, on stream over the next few years, uh, which you know then uh, provides a narrative of its own for the gas market, which is quite independent of what's happening in the oil market. So I, th I think it's very important to make that distinction uh, and focus on gas specifically. Uh, are you saying, Howard, then, that did, did gas producers, LNG producers in particular, um, overreact to what were a set of rather um, remarkable and unforecastable circumstances? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I think if you go back to 2011, 2012, when the Australian projects were, you know, going for FID, um, two, two common assumptions were being made. Firstly, that the demand for LNG in China was, was going to be infinite. And secondly, that nobody really foresaw the scope for uh, LNG exports from the U.S. Because at the time, I think the jury was still out as to whether U.S. shale gas, um, you know, had the scale and longevity that I think most observers now would ascribe to it. Um, and um, Cameron, well, I mean, what's your take on the, the implication that um, oil prices might really be lower forever? Well, I think, um, you know, Howard's certainly right that we've got uh, the possibility of the fortunes of gas and oil changing quite dramatically. So even if there is a gain in gas, it's feasible that oil prices are lower forever, as Dieter puts it. I mean, you can interpret that in various ways. It could be lower than previous highs of 110 plus, um, perhaps not lower forever than 40, given where we are right now anyway. But, I mean, at Aurora, the, the work, that, the research we've done there was suggesting prices in the 70, 60 range pre-crash uh, as prices that balance the market. Actually, not loads has changed. Um, you know, our, our general global models that look at oil markets um, similarly suggest prices equilibrating the market in the 60 to 70 range, even if, you know, the more complicated 
structural VAR models suggest you know prices around the 40 mark by the end of the year with various probabilities. So look, I think yeah, I mean it'd be surprising if oil does return to those heady peaks. They, they, I mean even 50 or 60 is a high price in historical terms, and so you then have to ask yourself the question: you know, what's what what are going to be the different fortunes of gas and oil? And on that question, uh, I mean, do you buy um, Dieter's implication that um, uh, the, the decline in demand for oil could be um, steeper and quicker than expected, but actually that might in the short to medium term be good for gas? Yeah, look, I think that's, that's not implausible at all. I mean, uh, the, the reason we're seeing hub race pricing for gas is because gas demand in power, uh, unlike oil or gas demand in other sectors, is increasingly separable. And I mean, you can even imagine a world where we get lots and lots of electric vehicles being powered from grids that have more gas uh, on them. Uh, so you, you've got that trend to look at over the next um, decade or two. And then, as Howard's alluded to, you know, the, the Chinese element here is really the big uncertainty, you could have, you know, there's variants of a couple of hundred BCM within what happens in Chinese scenarios to 2030, which is, you know, not miles off the scale of the, the market now. And that depends fairly strongly upon, you know, their, both their geopolitical situation, their economic stability, their political and mil military position. And you, thinking through those uh, models and the, the work again that Aurora has done suggests that we could be having a, a really golden age for gas where China soaks up a lot of that LNG capability or uh, equally uh, it could largely be entirely supplied by pipeline in which case we've got a uh, you know uh, <laughs> a golden age is not the phrase you'd be using. Um, uh, it's, it's sticking with you Cameron because there's one question I particularly want to ask it's a big question, though, so try and do it briefly. Um, DISA always makes this distinction between first-generation renewables and second-generation renewables, and crudely, um, first-generation, bad, we've thrown too much subsidy at them. Second-generation, let's just plow loads of R&D money into these things. I mean, it, how real is that? And isn't, isn't the future for second-generation renewables extremely unclear? and the implications of them for natural gas in particular um, pretty difficult to gauge. And aren't we again talking about pushing out timescales quite significantly? Yeah, there are quite a lot of questions there. Um, I mean, the, uh, there's obviously more than just two generations. It's a helpful kind of simplification device, I think, on, on Dieter's part. The, the pace of change in renewable generation is, of course, uncertain, to some degree predictable, but it's actually a lot more predictable than you think. And you know, Aurora has done quite a lot of work on so-called predictable surprises. Here at Oxford, we've also uh, got a whole team working on the predictability of technological progress. And what that work suggests is um, that you know, there is a kind of tick, tick, tick of progress, particularly in solar and wind, that is fairly steady. You get the odd, the odd fluctuation, but over decadal periods, um, you see where this thing is going. And in the long run, um, you know, it's not great for fossil producers because the, the rate of tech progress uh, over multi-decades in, in solar is, as we all know, phenomenal, and it doesn't look like um, stopping any time soon. There are a bunch of other issues that we're also working on in terms of integrating them into the grid, but, uh, but I think you know, if you're in the fossil space, it is something to, be, to have on your radar for sure. And, and Patrick, uh, I mean, you know, the, the focus of flame is obviously um, Europe. I mean, what do you, where do you see r Europe's role in the global gas market being um, in, uh, in, in the, the short term, certainly? And the um, um, second question really is about um, the, uh, the amount of LNG that may come from across the Atlantic into to Europe. What do we think about that? Um, uh, the price is probably the easiest answer because I think the, well, the amount will be linked to the price, and I think it will depend really of the supply demand. So if the supply is bigger than the demand globally, then I suspect the price will equalize uh, on the spike particularly to try to choke off the supply. But the role of, uh, of Europe is clearly for me uh, a role of a sink. Uh, Europe is, is quite a huge gas market, and compared to the rest of the world, 
it's a, it's a pretty liquid market. I know it's not that liquid going in the very long curve, but at least it can absorb a, a, a large amount of gas. And uh, it gives a price signal that everybody can relate to because it's quite developed. Obviously, the other market very developed is the U.S., but in this particular case, it's, uh, it's out of the equation. So I think we have a, uh, in Europe, we have a very large role to play to, uh, to equalize uh, the price in, uh, for global LNG. If you add to that the fact that we have a large amount of uh, regasification that, uh, that can be used in Europe, we, we can actually stay connected without the disconnection you have when basically you reach capacity. So that's why I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big role to play. Uh, my, my personal view, obviously, is that uh, if, if the world uh, gas consumption doesn't grow uh, in, in lock with supply, then at some point that gas will try to find its place to Europe, and in this case on, uh, on the spot market we'll see the price uh, reach to the level with the U.S. where we, we can cut the supply. Okay. Um, the question here to um, Howard, I think, uh, but uh, everyone can chip in on this one. Um, again, I think there's a sort of underlying, in fact, we, the, when I listen to it again, the, the, the broadcast, I don't think it is underlying, I think it's explicit. DISA seems to be forecasting the death of the, um, the IOC, uh, the, the, the multinational. But, I mean, surely these are not sort of uh, Neolithic comp uh, companies and by that I mean set in their ways, inflexible. Surely some of these companies are already thinking we are going to have to, if not reinvent ourselves, um, develop in different ways. How would you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think we're starting to see uh, the, the IOC starting to think more in terms of, you know, the, the potential gas has. Uh, as the the lowest carbon intensity fossil fuel, um, and, and kind of emphasising that, um, I, I guess they're probably a little bit uncertain what the future dynamics are for oil products. Although I, I, th I think they're, you know, trying to put a good face on that. But uh, you know, it, it 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 will be interesting to see how successful they are uh, at marketing gas as clearly much better than coal. Uh, in the still growing markets of uh, the Asian region as a whole, where I kind of suspect that many of those countries are, are hoping they can get away with more coal burn uh, if they invest a little bit in renewables at the same time. So this is a, it's, it's an interesting new challenge, I think, for the IOCs in that uh, rather than sitting across the table from blue chip uh, South Korean or Japanese buyers, uh, they now have to put their marketing hats on and really go to uh, some of the smaller high-growth markets and um, really make the case for LNG and gas in, in the energy mix there, more so than they've had to do in the past. Yeah, we always talk about um, uh, the poor job that we've done as a, a sector. I think we're possibly a little bit hard on ourselves sometimes, but, but never mind. Um, another one for, for you, Patrick. Um, the questions come in, um, and it says the oil price is now creeping up. I mean, when we checked before the broadcast, it was just under $40 Brent. Uh, the gas price is still rooted to the floor as it competes with coal for the power generation market. Uh, are we seeing, at last, the end of the artificial link between gas and oil prices? And I wish I had a pound for every time I've been asked that. <laughs> Me too. I'll be uh, retired by now. Now, uh, for first... Uh, Gas rooted to the bottom, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, that's probably a separate discussion, but are, are we sure that gas has actually reached uh, reach the bottom? That, um, that's something that uh, we could discuss for another hour. But to, lo to talk about the link with, uh, with oil, you know, uh, I, think, I think purposely the link to oil in Europe has, has definitely kind of disappeared. Uh, and and for, for, I mean, let's not go down the discussion. It could take for a very long time, but I think it's disappeared. However, as we, we are moving to global gas, we are rediscovering the importance of oil because obviously now the competition, the competi competition fuel, sorry, for LNG or in, in the world is either coal or actually oil products. Um, and there is obviously a lot of long-term contracts on uh, index on oil on LNG. So I think I would not bury yet the link between oil and gas, but I don't think it will come from the oil indexation in Europe. If you see what I mean. Um, yes, I do, yeah. Um, now, uh, 
what about this one for you, Cameron? Um, what is your view of the role of natural gas in the energy transition hot topic at the moment? Yeah, uh, it is. It's, uh, it's hot because it's pretty important. I'm talking about this uh, shortly in another conference. The, the, the short answer is that if you progress forwards 30 or 40 years, um, we know that to have 50-50 odds of limiting temperatures to 2 degrees, we've got to get net emissions to zero. Uh, now, gas is not net zero. It's half coal, half, roughly half oil. Um, and, but you can work back from that point to say, okay, at what point do we need to stop investing in new infrastructure that's long-lived? And our team at Oxford is about to release a paper that just does this, um, so I can't give the game away just yet, but, but the, the, the rough answer is very, very soon. Um, so it gives gas a, a role, for sure, in the transition, and potentially a long-term role, depending very, very strongly on how rapidly... CCS and more broadly carbon capture costs come down. Uh, and if they can come down and can be deployed, then you've got gas around for you know, potentially quite a while, not least because of all of the other benefits. Much cleaner fuel, it doesn't kill millions of people a year as coal does. Um, so it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a clear short-term win, very short-term win. Uh, it may be a medium win and it may even be a long-term win, but it is contingent upon rapid tech progress on carbon capture. Um, yeah, about which some of us are extremely sceptical. Um, I mean, on, on the same on the, on the same um, uh, theme, um, I think that one of the big nightmares for um, the natural gas sector is battery technology. Uh, and is there a scenario in which battery technology takes a real leap forward, and then you see gas um, doomed as a fuel for power generation? Well, battery doesn't need to take a huge leap forward. It is a bit like solar, just coming down year on year at a reliable rate. And, you know, whether it's in the early 2020s or and we're already seeing profitable installation of battery technologies on grids for ancillary and, and other balancing services, you know, whether it comes in big time, or again, Aurora's done this work, uh, early 2020s or late 2020s, um, it's likely to play... Uh, a, an important role, not the only role, but an important role in stabilizing power grids. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a role for gas. Uh, you know, there's some degree to which these are um, substitute technologies, but they're not fully substitutes because you know, obviously um, you, you, you can have all the storage you like, but you're not going to be able to cover a two-week seasonal minimum in energy across the winter in northern Europe without really substantial storage or flexible generation as we have with gas, whether it's recips, gas recips, or OCGTs or CCGTs. Yeah, I just I do wonder though whether there's a great deal of enthusiasm for uh, amongst generators for gas as backup. I mean, certainly in the UK, we seem to be struggling to get um, additional new capacity. I'm going to switch geographically though, because there's a, a question come in which I'm going to give to you, Howard. Um, is the seemingly important sh future short term uh, for natural gas, is that what's driving developments in the eastern Mediterranean? Again, it's a big question. Well, I, th I think the East Med um, is, is an interesting geological province, uh, but, I, but I think the problem there is that once these big fires have been discovered, uh, the politicians really don't know what to do with them. Um, probably the the, the, the one where there is a clear requirement is the um, the big field recently discovered in deep water off Egypt, which, uh, once it's developed, probably answers Egypt's problems of, you know, burgeoning demand in excess of its resource base due to low regulated domestic prices. Um, however, I think that the you know the the, the the most opinion is that it will probably not. Um, enable Egypt to again become uh, an LNG exporter. But, I mean, the, the, the wider situation, I think, is that we have all this LNG coming on stream now. Um, a combination of Asian demand growth, uh, European domestic production decline, and maybe a little bit of demand growth in Europe, would you could expect to clear that glut in the early 2020s um, but then you have to ask yourself, well, what, what will Russia want to do with its 100 BCMA or so of excess productive capacity 
um, which it, it could choose to uh, export to Europe and, and prolong the glut for a little bit longer. But we're in this awkward situation now where, um, you know, people looking at gas prices, uh, certainly in the UK, competitive with coal in the power sector. Uh, but it's important to remember that, you know, these prices are too low uh, for most new project FIDs, whether they be LNG or West Siberian gas. That's not really an issue whilst we've got these supplies, you know, already committed to. Um, but it does become an issue in the early 2020s when prices will have to rise to levels to bring on new supply. Um, that's a big problem if you're an LNG project uh, uh, sponsor because you need to know what's going to happen five years down the line from your FID decision. It's going to be a very difficult market to read for the facts I've just described. Uh, just one quick final question, um, and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, and this is to, to Patrick. Um, how do you see um, Norway's role um, in the short and medium term? Um, I think Norway, obviously, is, uh, I, would, I don't want to say anything, like uh, it's a price taker in the sense that the production is, uh, is not mobile, really. It's trapped in Northern Europe. So, in a way, they will have to take the price that's there, and then there will be a decision, obviously, for the Norwegian authorities to decide if they want to defer production or not. But uh, I, I think they could play the role that they've played in the past of the swing producer, uh, but they could as well decide to just produce and, uh, and in this case, uh, they will have to take whatever price is there. But uh, unlike Russia, who seems to be opening a few other routes, uh, I don't, I don't see Norway, aside of a bit of LNG export, able to uh, to change really their, their 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 target market. Okay, thanks, Howard. Thanks, Patrick, and uh, thanks, Cameron. Thanks. That's all we have time for today. I'm afraid. Thanks to our panel and our listeners for joining us again today. We're really excited about seeing you at Flame in just a few months' time on the 9th through the 12th of May in Amsterdam. If you have any feedback on today's webinar or any recommendations for future webinars, please do complete a short survey at the end of this webinar. It should flash up on your screen shortly. Thanks very much again and goodbye.